All right, so today uh, I'll be talking about uh, some hay and pasture herbicides, uh, some updates there, um, updates that uh, I can provide about uh, uh, EPA uh, reviews on some specific herbicides. And then uh, uh, I'll just hit on some basic weed control updates uh, in this presentation. Uh, my name's uh, Scott Nolte. I'm the Extension Weed Specialist uh, for the state, um, located in College Station, Texas. So I'm going to start off today uh, just talking about, uh, uh, again, as I mentioned, some new herbicides that have come to the market, uh, new, newer um, products in the last year or two years, uh, that we now have an opportunity to use as uh, additional tools. Um, it's kind of a unique time in the hay and pasture market. Uh, typically there's not been, you know, a lot of activity for new herbicides uh, to be introduced maybe once a decade. Uh, and we've gotten, uh, you know, two to three new products that have hit in the last, like I said, year to two years. Uh, and so I just wanna go through some of those uh, products and some updates on on how to use those. So the first herbicide I want to talk through is uh, Resilon herbicide from Bayer. Uh, the, this was one that uh, was brought to market approved by EPA uh, in late 2020. Uh, we did recently uh, in, the, in the first part of this year uh, get approval uh, for use in the state of Texas from the Department of Ag here. Uh, the, the active ingredient for Resilon is, is in Dazaflam. It's a group 29 uh, herbicide. And this, this active ingredient, so this isn't necessarily a, 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 a new herbicide. It's new for, for hay and pasture use, uh, but it's not uh, a new herbicide that we've you know, just recently uh, been, been able to use and learn about. It's been around for think approximately 10 years and in other markets, uh, right of ways. Uh, it's an active ingredient that's available for use in turf uh, situations. Um, I believe those commercial names are, I think it's Esplanade for the, uh, the, the right of way areas. Um, Spectacle Flow is the, the product that, uh, the commercial product that's uh, available for use in turf. Um, and I guess I'll take this, you know, opportunity to just kind of plug because I've gotten questions in the past. Um, so is this something I can use on my, in my yard? Um, it, the active ingredient is available for use on your, your turf or, or right away areas, uh, but you need to use the, the proper labeled uh, product for those use areas. Um, Resilon is going to be labeled for use. Um, in, like I said, hay, pasture um, situations, but is not labeled for use in those other areas. Okay, so um, use of this product, at, a lot like a lot of other products that are on the market um, that, that are residual pre-emergent type products, uh, this one also is gonna require some activation. And typically that, you know, in, the, in this hay pasture kind of uh, setting, that's, that's typically going to mean well, we need rainfall or irrigation uh, in order to activate that herbicide. And when, we, when, I'm re when I'm referring to activation, I'm talking about that herbicide needs to get moved into the soil profile uh, in that top one to two inches of the soil. That's where, that's where our weed seeds are going to be germinating at. And so you know, a, a herbicide works by being taken up into that newly germinating seed through the roots or through the shoot that's coming out of that seed. It doesn't prevent the seed from germinating. It prevents the germinating seedling uh, from continuing to grow. And so in order for that, that herbicide to work, it has to be in that, that like I said, that top one to two inch layer uh, where it can take up be taken up into that germinating seedling through the soil moisture. Um, and so it has to be in that zone for it to work. If it's just laying on top of the ground, it's laying on top of the, the residue that's on the ground, um, you're not gonna have good
good activity. The, the thing that is a bit different about this product compared to, you know, a, uh, let's say a, a product like pendimethalin or Prowl uh, would be a commercial name for that, that active ingredient. Um, Resilon has a, a, is a bit more robust than something like uh, Prowl. Um, when you apply a pendimethalin product, you need to get that same rainfall activation, but if you don't get it within seven days, your, your level of activity weed control begins to drop off very rapidly. With Resilon, uh, we have the opportunity to be able to make earlier applications uh, because that rainfall, that activation that needs to happen, that, that because that product is a bit more robust, it's not gonna break down. And so we, you know, if we get that activating rainfall within a week, two weeks, um, we, we have a, a quite a bit more time um, to get that activation uh, without the product breaking down. We don't we don't have photo degradation um, with this herbicide uh, like we do with uh, pendimethalin. So when we're making applications, uh, uh, again, it, it gives us a, a better window, you know, and, and so the, the company's kind of line as early as on time. Um, again, with our traditional products that we have been using in this, in this space for uh, hay and pasture use, right? We're, we're trying to time it just right. Okay, well, I don't want to, I don't want to apply too early, then it'll run out. Um, I don't want to apply it too late uh, because then we're getting germinating seedlings and we need to get that herbicide, herbicide on before those seeds begin to germinate. So again, with the, the increased flexibility, the long residual with the reduced voter degradation allows us to put this product out a bit earlier um, and have the confidence that we can get out before seeds are germinating and then still have good residual activity for um, you know, a, a longer period of time after application. Okay, application use rates on, her, on Resilon. Uh, we're going to be in the three to five uh, ounce per acre rate range. <clears throat> uh, so a single use, the max rate is going to be that five ounces. And really our preferred, I think, recommendation uh, based on the, the, the data that we've seen uh, collected, uh, and I'll talk about that in a couple of slides, is a three by three. And so it's going to be a three ounce application uh, followed by another three ounce application. That's where we're going to get the really uh, what I've seen is the, the best weed control uh, and for a longer period of time. Six ounces per acre is going to be the max use rate in a 12 month period. And again, that six ounce max is, you know, only going to be able to be achieved by, by using the three by three uh, three followed by three ounce um, applications. Now at rates, and this is something to keep in mind uh, if you're going to be harvesting hay, at rates over three ounces, you cannot harvest that hay for 40 days. So if you use three ounces, you're good. If you apply three and a quarter, um, you can't harvest that hay for 40 days in a single application. So again, if you do the three followed by three, um, you, you're good on that, that hay harvest. There are no rate grazing restrictions following uh, applications of Resilon. So the target weeds that we're looking at, um, what is this, you know, where is this use gonna be um, um, really applicable? Um, and so we're looking at target weeds of crabgrass, ryegrass, goosegrass, uh, annual foxtails, sandbur, and then there's a, a, a list of, you know, uh, around 60 broadleaf and annual grass weeds that Resilon is going to be able to work on. But these top five here that I've listed off are really the, I think, where we're um, probably going to see the most use um, and, and 
this herbicide being beneficial in the, again, in the hay and pasture market. So I just want to talk a little bit about some of the testing that's been done uh, in Texas um, prior to Resilon coming to the market. Uh, and so we've done testing from uh, 2016 to 2019 uh, at a variety of locations. Actually, I need to update that. We've done um, additional testing in 2020. But we've, we've looked at this product in a variety of locations, kind of in the, the east central part of Texas. We've been testing it specifically on uh, its ability to control annual ryegrass, crabgrass, and sand burr. Uh, those, those tend to be three of the uh, more problematic grasses uh, in our Bermuda grass pastures. And we've also then, uh, along with that, uh, been collecting data and making evaluations on the uh, the product safety in those Bermuda grass pasture uh, situations. And so we want to verify, you know, are we going to have good safety uh, at those rates that are recommended? Uh, and is it compared to, again, our kind of our commercial standard, the typical herbicides that we've been using? So I want to talk a little bit about some of the data that we've collected on these various species. And so uh, I want to start here with the annual ryegrass study that we conducted in 2016 in College Station. Uh, so lots of numbers here, treatments, um, what I want to focus on. Uh, so at this point in the, in the testing, we weren't sure what the maximum rates were going to be for this uh, commercial product in the end. Um, so we were looking at you know, rates varying from three and a half to seven ounces. Uh, we looked at combinations, you know, tank mixed with Pastora um, and Cimarron Plus. And we were, uh, again, just trying to evaluate a variety of rates and combinations to see what was going to work well on annual ryegrass. And so this data is looking at uh, the level of uh, control uh, percent control of annual ryegrass um, at one month and three months after our treatment. And so you can see, uh, of course, as the rate increased to Resilon, uh, we did get, um, you know, maintained a higher level of control on annual ryegrass at that highest seven ounce rate. Uh, however, in the rate range that we're labeled for, uh, we're seeing you know, close to 90 and, and at uh, just above 90% control of annual ryegrass three months after treatment uh, with that three and a half and five ounce rate. We do see some, um, a, a bit of added benefit, of course, by tank mixing with Pastora uh, at an ounce and a half, uh, keeping that three month uh, activity up uh, around 95% control. And, and I will, uh, I do also want to mention here um, that if we're depending on, you know, the, the species that we're targeting, uh, obviously is going to dictate when we're going to make these applications, what's the, the appropriate timing. And so when we're going after annual ryegrass, uh, most of our applications uh, have gone out in the, the College Station area, if we're going out in mid to late October. Uh, to, uh, again, to make sure that we're getting out, you know, before that uh, annual ryegrass really gets started germinating. So here I'm just showing some pictures um, of the activity that we got from that um, trial in College Station 2016, uh, right? Photos tell a better story sometimes than the data. Uh, and again, I'm showing the Resilon uh, treatments at three and a half and five ounces because those are ones that uh, really are the rates we're going to be dealing with. Uh, and so you can see it at three and a half ounces, we've got about 85% control three months after treatment. Uh, and here's just a, a picture of that Resilon at five, five ounces. Um, and that was about 95% control. And you can see our non-treated strips on the sides, uh, either side of this treated area uh, we have quite a bit of uh, heavy uh, annual ryegrass pressure, uh, as well as can be seen in the untreated check above, above those photos.
Okay, so if, uh, a follow up to that, right? So as we um, began to progress year after year with evaluating this product, uh, we started to refine the treatments a little bit, uh, and again, hone in on those. You know, what are what are the potential use rates going to be? Um, can we can we look at sequential applications and get maybe some extended level of control because weeds aren't just coming up, you know, at, in, at one time, right? Um, annual ryegrass isn't just, um, you know, germinating in the fall and then it's, it's not a problem anymore or uh, crabgrass or sand burr. We get multiple flushes uh, over the, the length of the season sometimes. And so we wanted to evaluate um, can we extend that level of control, that level of residual uh, over time by splitting up these applications? And so in this, this particular study, uh, we're looking at Resilon, a uh, single application of three ounces. Uh, again, the three followed by three ounce um, application. And so our, our first application at the A timing went out again in, in um, mid to late October, the follow-up application went out actually in early February. And so again, looking at the five ounce rate and then comparing, um, you know, again, to what would be our typical commercial standard um, of prowl at four quarts. <clears throat> and then we also looked at, you know, just coming in uh, in, the, in the spring, early spring in February, with, with just a kind of a post application. Uh, at that point, obviously we have existing um, ryegrass that is emerged. And so we looked at Resilon at three and five ounces along with Prowl at four quarts uh, and then tank mixed with Roundup at 35 ounces. And so the Roundup is there um, to, uh, again, basically burn down any annual ryegrass that may be emerged um, and then we're assessing what's the benefit of a, this later application, um, just applying these herbicides in early February. And so as you can see with this data, uh, we're again, we're seeing good control. Uh, this is in 2017 in Ellis County. So this is seven months after the initial application and in, in October, uh, we have very good control uh, with all of these Resilon treatments um, and Prowl really, you know, at that point, not, not providing uh, very good control at all, less than 30%. Okay, switching gears, looking at large crabgrass. Uh, so this again is another one that, that tends to be uh, really problematic, I think, in of course, in a lot of scenarios, but um, especially for the, for the hay market, um, having crabgrass in in those uh, fields really messes up the the hay production uh, and and value of any of that that hay that's being sold. Um, we we are seeing some really good um, activity with with Resilon on the large crabgrass. Um, I, I don't feel like we have enough data that I can be super confident that in all scenarios, it's gonna look um, as good or better than, uh, again, kind of our commercial standard prowl at 2.1 quarts. Um, in this study, we looked at Resilon at three and five, um, and then again, split application uh, of three and three. And, we, we also looked at Resilon at five and three, but again, that was early on before uh, we knew what the, the total rate structure would be. Um, and then comparing that to split applications of Prowl. And these, these letters that you see at the end of the bars actually indicate is, are these significantly different? Um, and if you notice, all these are A's, which tell us none of these are significantly different. Um, and so while we may have a, a trending differences, you know, numbers that, that are higher than others uh, based on the variability of the trial. Uh, we can't say with confidence that, that, you know, this split application of three and three is actually any better than uh, a single application. 
However, again, based on you know a couple of other trials that we've been conducting, uh, we are seeing, like I said, good activity on crabgrass uh, that I think will be equivalent to um, the the two quart rate of prowl. Okay, switching over to everybody's favorite uh, sandbur. Uh, this was actually a timing study that we conducted um, in 2019. We had a, a, a number of locations here. I'm presenting data that came from the College Station site. Um, and as the, as the title says, uh, we, we applied these um, different rates of Resilon uh, and, and tank mixes at three different um, timings. Uh, for Sandbur, our initial timing that we went out with at was uh, mid to late March uh, in 2019. That was actually, uh, you know, we were we were getting that out right before uh, Sandbur were beginning to germinate. And uh, again, that's one of the the key things about controlling Sandbur is getting it out before it starts to germinate. Uh, a lot of those, a lot of those. Uh, Sandbur seedlings, you know, those seeds could be sitting right on top of the soil. Um, and so they can be a challenge to, to, to be controlled. And so some of these treatments we were actually tank mixing with, you know, things like Pastora and Roundup um, to see if we could improve control. Um, and really not, not a lot of, of, of change. Um, so in this particular study, we, we actually had Resilon uh, three ounces uh, in March, and then we came back with Pastor and Roundup uh, in May, early May. Um, and that, that follow-up of Pastor and Roundup actually did not look nearly as good as three ounces of Resilon followed by three ounces at the same timings. And so we got much better control of Sandbur by splitting the applications of Resilon. Um, and, and basically at that point, you're getting overlapping residual activity, right? So if you can control the Sandbur um, with that, that early application from even coming up, as long as you come back with that second application of Resilon, you know, before the first one kind of runs out, you, you, you're essentially giving yourself that blanket uh, of level of control, you know, of a, over a much longer period of time. And then we looked at, uh, again, different timings. Uh, we had a, another treatment here where we applied uh, the Resilon with Pastora and Roundup uh, in, again, in June, oh, sorry, May, and then uh, followed it up with another Resilon shot actually in July. Um, not much different than, you know, the split application. Looked at uh, Resilon at five ounces with Pastor and Roundup uh, applied in May. Uh, again, so there's a variety of really of combinations and ways that these, that, that Resilon can be used uh, to manage Sandbur, depending on the particular uh, scenario, environmental conditions that you're experiencing. So there's some flexibility with this product. Uh, all those treatments that we had, we also included, as, you know, a, a split application of Prowl two and two. Um, and, and again, Prowl is always a challenge. Pendimethylin, uh, again, always a challenge because it's so dependent on that proper activation um, and, and correct timing, you know, that you, you get uh, an activating rainfall. Uh, and unfortunately, in this scenario, we did not get a, a good timely uh, activation of, of prowl. Um, and it really, it kind of fell flat. Okay, so to kind of summarize up uh, what we're seeing with Resilon, you know, as far as weed control and forage safety, um, we, overall, we just get a longer residual level of control on ryegrass and crabgrass. Um, what we've seen so far, we get a greater consistency of control on sandbur compared to uh, the pendimethylin herbicides uh, across 
a variety of years and environments, uh, we've continued to see that. Um, and so it, again, it just, I feel like provides greater flexibility um, with those applications. Uh, I've had too many producers come back to me and say, I've applied Prowl uh, or I applied pendimethalin and it didn't work. Um, and when we go back through, you know, it's usually comes down to that, that activating rainfall. Um, and if you get too far past the spring, um, it, it becomes really difficult to make sure that you get it out in front of a, a, a timely rainfall event. Uh, and, and I didn't show the data, but our tests do show that we have comparable forage safety to, to the other products that are on the market. Um, any kind of um, injury or symptomology that we did see show up um, was, was generally less than about 10 to 15%. Um, normally we didn't see any, there were only occasional um, times that we did see some uh, some of that injury show up, but it's uh, again, very minor um, and no, and certainly no greater than what we would, would see with other herbicides. We do have some work that is ongoing, um, just evaluating activity on some seedling perennial grass species. Uh, obviously this is not gonna have post activity uh, because it is a pre-emerge herbicide. Um, but we're, we're working on some, uh, some research and some treatments that, that would evaluate, okay, if we could get those <clears throat> existing perennial plants um, eliminated, does Resilon have activity on any seeds that might be left in the soil uh, of those perennial grass species? Um, and so while the work continues to control existing um, problematic perennial grasses, uh, we're also looking at, well, we, we are gonna, if we can control them, we're gonna have to have the tools um, to, to continue managing those seeds that are in the soil, right? So we have that soil seed bank um, that, that we're gonna also have to manage in following years, right? So weed control is not a, a single year problem. Uh, we have to think about it as a, a multi-year uh, scenario that we're gonna have to manage over, you know, uh, sometimes four or five, um, 10 years with, with the data that we have on longevity of some of these seeds in the soil. Okay, and I just want to touch on this um, briefly uh, because we are, um, I have some graduate students uh, that are working on some native species type uh, projects, looking at different uh, herbicide tolerance on a variety of native species. Uh, this is actually a um, what I'm showing here on the right uh, is actually some research that was uh, published um, looking at the, the effect of endazaflam on, on some native species. Um, it does suggest that there might be some safety um, to established um, perennial native perennial species. Um, however, it does, you know, prevent germination of other problematic grasses and broadleaves. Um, it could reduce your Forbes uh, as well. And so ju just bringing that up to say that there's opportunity for more research in our region um, for us to learn more about that. And a, a, again, another tool that we can maybe uh, work into our, our herbicide management programs beyond just our introduced species. Okay, so now I wanna move on to the next uh, herbicide that has been introduced more recently. Again, not Dr. something- Hildy. Yes. Can I ask a question before we leave the pre-emerge part? Absolutely. Uh, you know, a lot of that depends on, on timing, as you mentioned, but uh, we would like to have a calendar date, but we also know that there's a lot of variations across the state. So what what's for, for maybe all those species, but particularly sandbar, what is your uh, preferred maybe soil temperature or how do we decide when when to put out, uh, in this case, particularly the Resolon. Right, so, so great question. Uh, so, so adding in some temperatures um, to this presentation would be a good um, additional piece of information um, to, to provide, right? So 
we we do know that uh, for for each of these there is a, a an average soil temperature uh, at which these various species will germinate at. Um, most of these, um, I believe, were probably in the between 50 and 60 degrees on soil temperature. Um, I, I, I can't tell you off the top of my head the exact um, temperature for each of them, but um, that that would be the uh, one additional piece to um, to be aware of, right? As we as we start getting to that point where the conditions are um, conducive for those different species to germinate. We need to be having that herbicide out um, prior to those, those conditions being in place. Uh, I think that, that kind of goes back to that company's tagline of, you know, early is on time. Um, and, I, and again, I, I think just hitting on that flexibility of those, that product that I can put it out and have confidence that it's not going to break down and be gone um, before it's, it's useful. Uh, right with some of the other herbicides, we're, we're we're trying so hard to get the timing right of like, okay, well, I I need to wait, um, but I don't want to wait too long. I need to get it out just before emergence happens, um, and also try to time it when I get uh, a rainfall event. Um, and so, I think with 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 Resolon, you, you're going to have the opportunity to say, well, I think we're getting into that that window where, you know emergence is going to be occurring soon. You've, you've got a little bit more buffer where, okay, I can go ahead and put it out and I'm not going to be too early. If you were going to have a second application, particularly with Resolon, what would the time it be for that? So you don't have a control gap, but you also take full advantage of the first application. Right. And so that's a, that's a good question as well. Um, and, and, and we have, you know, in, in some of these studies that, you know, and I showed some of that data um, for annual ryegrass, some of those applications were going out um, in October and then follow-up applications being made in February. Um, and so, you know, I think like any good scientist or extension person, um, you know, our answer always involves a, well, it depends. <laughs> um, and this is one of those things where it's going to depend on the environmental conditions. Um, in, in our environmental conditions that we saw in that study, uh, you know, the difference between late October, you know, we're looking at four months before the follow-up application was made. Um, in, in more arid dry conditions, if we don't have as much rainfall and we don't have the conditions to break that herbicide down as quickly, we, we can actually get a longer level of residual. Um, and in the um, Northwest um, states, uh, there's an endazoflam product that was labeled along with this as kind of a sister product. They have a much more arid you know, set of conditions. And in, in that location, um, they're using it for more range, um, you know, weed control on some really problematic grasses and, and they may get two, three, four years of residual. Um, again, it's, it, it, it's highly dependent on, uh, you know, those, those weather conditions and how quickly that herbicide will get broken down, um, based on rainfall temperature, um, like I said, it's, it's just, it's not as sensitive to photo degradation, which allows it to be much more stable. Um, I can't give you an exact, you know, well, it's going to last three months in our area. That's, that's probably a pretty average number for where we're at. We might see three to four months of, of control. Um, and so, you know, scouting, it's always something that we, we recommend, um, you know, knowing when um, you're getting breaks, uh, things begin to emerge and break through. Okay. It's, you know, herbicide degradation kind of works on that curve of we start out at a rate 
um, really in the soil that is uh, almost a higher level than is required um, because by the time we get to that three month mark at that, it's at that point that the herbicide is broken down to a, a rate in the soil that is no longer active. And the, the time that it takes to get to that inactive point, to, to, again, depends on soil moisture, temperature, um, and microbe activity. So if we're targeting sand burr, you really probably want to be getting out there before um, temperatures are, are getting into that 55 degree range. Um, we've seen sand burr uh, begin to emerge as early as, you know, soil temperatures at 52 uh, and continue to, to emerge, honestly, um, through August. Um, and, and one thing to, to keep in mind in this particular region, uh, especially with sand burr, we have seen some of these um, clumps. We're not going to call it perennial. Sand burr is not a perennial um, plant. Uh, but we have seen overwintering of, of kind of that crown, that clump that can occur with sand burr. Um, and if you're, if you're dealing with that, you're, you're in an area that's far enough south, we've seen it here in the College Station area and, and maybe just a little bit north of us. Um, and I think that's, that may be part of the problem that we're, we're, when we're hearing about, you know, some of these herbicides didn't work. Well, you're trying to manage it with a residual pre-emerge herbicide. And if you've got a clump that overwintered, you're not going to kill that, that clump of sand burr. You're going to need to put something like a Roundup or Pastora or something that's going to burn down that, that existing green vegetation that, uh, that, that didn't die over winter. Now, we, we had some, some challenging weather um, a, a week ago here. Uh, where we got some really cold temperatures for, um, you know, several days in a row. Um, that was, that was really impactful and, and, and problematic for a lot of folks. Um, the, the one potential benefit of that is that maybe we were able to knock down some of those sandburg clumps <laughs> that have been overwintering. Okay. So hopefully that, uh, that, that answered your, your question, Brent. Yes, thank you. All right, so I'm going to move on. Uh, we're going to talk about Duracore next. Uh, this is a herbicide that not not newly introduced in the past year, but uh, more recently in the last couple of years, a product that came to the market. Uh, the active ingredients in Duracore are aminopyrrolid and fluoropyroxifen benzyl. Um, I will give you a pass if you cannot pronounce that. Um, the company... Uh, also felt that it was difficult um, and, and gave the active ingredient a branded name called Renscore. Um, I don't know that that's why they did it, but uh, we're going to, we're going to go with that. Um, the herbicide is non-restricted. Uh, and so that is a benefit because that does not require an applicator's license to purchase and apply it. Uh, and that's, you know, I'll, I'll talk in the next slide just about some of the comparisons to other products uh, that are similar, have similar activity that Duracore is kind of, um, you know, we're going to be comparing uh, levels of control. Um, and some of those products do require an applicator's license. So for Duracore herbicide, the um, recommended rates are going to range from 12 to 20 ounces per acre with the maximum of, of 20 ounces. Uh, there are no grazing restrictions when using this product, um, but there are some ag adjuvant recommendations that you do need to be aware of um, that, that are going to, you know, increase the activity uh, and ensure good control of uh, a number of these, these plants that we're going after. And so that would be including, uh, you know, a, a non-ionic surfactant at a quarter percent volume per volume or um, a methylated seed oil at 1% volume per volume. All right, some, some additional details. Um, Duracore is non-volatile. 
uh, and, and it also has a, a lower odor compared to some of the other similar products out there. Uh, it is a broadcast, uh, foliar broadcast herbicide. You can mix it with um, UAN uh, or it can be applied uh, on dry fertilizer. So you can apply it as a um, herbicide impregnated on uh, dry fertilizer. I have seen um, some photos. Um, I think most of the time this works well. You do have to pay attention to your uh, fertilizer that you use and select for the, uh, you know, an impregnation uh, process that you have some good quality prills and not a lot of dust. Um, I have in, in reference to the, the photos, that scenario was uh, a situation where, you know, it was applied with a spreader um, and slinging it out, you got good control everywhere, but then basically kind of in a, you know, a, a small swath right behind the spreader, uh, there was some injury to the um, the forage. Um, and that was most likely due to settling of the dust, maybe on the leaves. Uh, and then you got a, a heavy dew um, shortly after that. And so it was likely a concentration of a higher rate than you would have received with a, a, a broadcast foliar application. So this is something to be aware of. Um, it's, it's a, you know, it's a rare instance, uh, but it can happen. Uh, the cost, and so this is, uh, you know, a, a number that was just pulled as a um, kind of a retail rate. Um, I'm sure, you know, numbers vary. And so we're just providing this as sort of a comparison, uh, not to say this is, you know, you couldn't get it cheaper or might be more expensive somewhere else. Um, but um, from one retailer, the cost was 95, about $95 per gallon, um, which yeah, compared to graze on next or graze on P plus D, you're you look at that and think, man, graze on next or or P plus D, you're talking forty eight to thirty dollars per gallon. That that Dura course seems really expensive, but you have to think about the fact that the use rate is almost half of what these other products are, right? So we have a more concentrated active ingredient um, and a lower use rate, and so that brings the the actual cost per acre. Um, down and maybe more in line, uh, very similar to these other products. So we're talking 742 to, you know, almost $15 per acre with, with Duracore compared to um, nine bucks an acre uh, or seven and a half dollars an acre uh, with these other products at the typical use rates. All right, so just to cover a little bit of data, uh, and this is data supplied um, by Corteva. Um, just to highlight the activity uh, of this product compared to uh, other products out there. Graze on next um, HL at 24 ounces, um, you know, achieving about 82% control compared to 90% control with Duracore um, on things like annual marsh elder, um, ironweed. Uh, those are some, some weeds that we typically have kind of in this area. Um, looking at it on some thistles, dock, croton, um, again, ironweed, nightshade, um, uh, some, some examples of some weeds that we have in this area. Um, Duracore is going to be very similar to what we would expect from Grazon Next HL at about 92% control. And so these would be what we would consider core weeds um, that, that this product is going to be able to to work on well. Um, some of these, the timing is gonna be important, right? So um, paying attention to those herbicide labels as mentioned here at the bottom, um, there are some notes there about, you know, there are specific stages that you're gonna to need to be applying, right? And we talk about that a lot, spraying, um, spraying these weeds at the appropriate timing when they're small, uh, the broad leaves um, is gonna be important. So here's some, some photos that were provided by um, an, an extension specialist um, that did one of these trials um, north of College Station. Uh, this is Duracore at 16 ounces uh, on snow of the mountain and mature broomweed. Uh, and so you can, you can see this was actually comparing, um, you know, Duracore at 16 ounces with NIS compared to MSO. They both look very similar. 
Uh, we've got a non-treated check down the middle uh, and you can see the level of activity on that, that snow on the mountain. Um, it, it's working very well, um, even out to two and a half months after treatment. <clears throat> Again, a picture showing a uh, level of Western ragweed control. Uh, and this was actually when Duracore was applied uh, impregnated on dry fertilizer. And so again, really good control on the Western ragweed um, even three months after, after treatment. The last herbicide that I wanna cover that uh, is again, newer to the market, um, not necessarily something that we would consider, you know, like uh, typical just broadleaf or grass weed control, um, but, but is probably more, um, you know, into the, the brush market. Um, Invora herbicide from Bayer uh, does have some, um, some broadleaf control uh, as well. So, uh, you know, if you have brush issues, um, I also want to just touch on some of the, the broadleaf control that it does uh, provide. So the active ingredients in, in Invora are aminocyclopyrichlor and triclopyr. And so there, there are gonna be some, um, some things we have to pay attention to if you're gonna be using this, uh, this product, right? So use rates are gonna range from 12 to 48 ounces depending on the species you're going after. It is a restricted use pesticide. So it's gonna require an applicator's license. And there are gonna be some other conditions that you're gonna to have to meet. And we'll talk about that in the, in the next slide. Like I said, it does provide excellent brush control. But in order to bring this product to market, Bayer had to work through some, some, um, some situations and, and make some concessions to be able to, to bring this to the market for at least a portion of the, um, the, the market out there. So this product can only be used in grazed settings. You cannot use this in hay production or for harvested sites. And so I know that, that frustrates some people, but at the same time, uh, well, in, if it were not for that concession to say, well, you can only use it in a gray setting, um, uh, it, like I said, it could, it could frustrate the hay producers, but if it wasn't for this, it wouldn't be even available for the, the, um, the grazed situation. Uh, there is an adjuvant recommendation to use an MSO at 1% volume per volume. Again, just a little bit of data. Um, there is some pre and, and post activity. Um, this is looking at um, a broadcast application on honey mesquite and we satch. And so uh, if we if we look at the, the we satch trial that was conducted, uh, this is a level of so basically the percent of canopy cover that's, that's, that still remains three years after the initial treatment. Uh, within Bora, there's only two and a half percent canopy cover uh, of, of Wesatch three years later, uh, whereas the, the, the traditional treatments are, are only providing, you know, 30, there's still 30% canopy cover uh, of the Wesatch. Um, in Vora on honey mesquite, uh, Again, only 2% uh, canopy cover of, of the honey mesquite eight and a half years after the initial treatment, uh, while other treatments are, you know, we're still seeing 25% canopy cover. So excellent activity on weed satch and honey mesquite. Um, and I, as I mentioned, other weeds that Invora will have good activity on uh, include uh, yucca, dog fennel, western ragweed, you know, the, the bitter sneeze weed and bull thistle. Okay, so here's kind of the, um, the, the, the caveat thing that you need to be aware of if you want to use uh, Invora herbicide as part of your uh, herbicide program uh, in these grazing situations. If you're going to apply it, it requires the picolinic acid chemistry training uh, or PACT. This training is available through the agrilifelearn.tamu.edu uh, website uh, where there are a number of trainings available. Um, 
this training is specific to Invora herbicide. It's, it's kind of like what we're seeing with uh, the dicamba herbicides. You have to have auxin training, uh, paraquat now. You have to have uh, a specific training to be able to use paraquat. Uh, this, this is sort of the trend that we're seeing with EPA with some of these herbicides that could potentially have um, some impact if they're not used properly. We wanna make sure that people are aware of those those risks and that they are aware of the things that, that they can do to minimize that risk. And so this is a training that you have to complete every two years. Uh, it's gonna get you one CEU in laws and regs with the course. And it is, it is available, like I said, it's available online and that's the, the only location that you can take it. Uh, I do wanna talk about some label changes um, and quickly I'll hit on Paraquat here. Um, like I said, there is new training uh, that was implemented, uh, let's see, maybe about a year ago. Um, why are we doing that? Not we. Why, why is EPA requiring this? Um, well, paraquats are restricted use pesticide and a single sip of this product can be fatal. And so what has been seen over the, the past number of years now um, is that there have been 17 deaths and three of those have been children uh, in the last 20 years due to accidental ingestion. And so we, we, we've talked about this. We, you know, if you've, if you've been in any um, program that talks about pesticide safety, you know, we have to understand that, you know, risk is a combination of, you know, lethal, lethality and exposure. And so paracrot's one of those things that is, it, it, it can be um, highly toxic. And so we need to, we need to really pay attention and limit the exposure of people that are using it. It's a good product. We just have to, to use it properly and, and manage the exposure. And so that's what this training is all about is training people to understand, um, you know, the, the, the toxicity and what we can do to, to limit exposure. So the training is required for anyone who intends to apply, mix, load, or use paraquat. And use means anyone that's involved in pesticide-related activities that involve paraquat. So use of paraquat is restricted to certified pesticide applicators. You have to complete the training prior to use and retake it every three years. Uh, like the, like the uh, Invora training, um, Paraquat training is available online. It is not provided through AgriLife Extension, um, and you can get to it at this usparaquattraining.com website. And for anybody that you know is interested, there are some good resources out there to, uh, again, better understand the situation. Um, some may ask, you know, well, why are we even using a product if it's uh, so potentially dangerous? Um, this, these resources are available to help people kind of understand, again, yes, it, it could be, it is a toxic pesticide, um, but it's, it's understanding the benefits, how we manage exposure, um, and how our ag production uh, folks are using this, this, this valuable tool. Okay, so moving on to um, some, some herbicide registration updates. I just wanna provide um, a, a bit of a snapshot. Uh, this, this is a, a, a constantly evolving situation. Um, and, and so I just wanna talk about a few herbicides that the EPA is in the process of um, evaluating. Um, you know, all herbicides uh, have a, a, a typical um, timeline that they are on for re-registration. And so uh, I'm just gonna hit on a, a couple of products that are in EPA's herbicide re-registration re process um, at the moment and, and some things that have been identified and, and what EPA is doing about that. Uh, so there's, and, and this re-registration process is not something that's quick. Um, and so each product is, is on a 15 year cycle where EPA, um, uh, again, reviews, you know, in the last 15 years, the advances have been made in technology or we've learned new things. Um, you know, 
research has been conducted, um, new things are found about different herbicides. And so, uh, again, EPA will, will go through this process to gather up any new information after 15 years on a product and reevaluate all of that um, for a, a decision to be made about, you know, are we going to re-register these products? Are there changes that need to be made? Do we need to adjust labels? Um, do we need to add more restrictions? Can we relax some of the restrictions? Uh, and so th that's what I'm going to just talk about here briefly with trizines. Um, EPA is going through atrazine, propazine, and simazine. Uh, some of these products uh, are, well, atrazine, uh, you know, has, has not been available for use in, in, in pastures for a while now. Uh, a lot of this is, is really probably more applicable to um, the, the turf market and the row crop market. Um, but, but this is a lengthy process. You know, EPA doesn't just get to the 15 year mark and go, okay, it's time to do it, you know, a couple days and it's done. Um, they've been working on this process starting in 2016. Uh, at that point, they did a draft ecological risk assessment where they look at the risk to animals and plants. And so they're evaluating that data set. Um, in 2018, they got to the point where they were ready to do the cumulative human health risk assessment. Uh, and so uh, again, they gather the data that's pertinent to, to that portion of the uh, review. And then in 2020, they released their interim registration review decision for all three herbicides. So it, over the course of four years, they gather all this data and do these evaluations and, and, it, and then um, release their interim uh, review decision. I just wanna hit on you know, what they've found from some of these um, different evaluations in their process. So the 2018 cumulative health, human health risk assessment. In that assessment, uh, they reviewed, again, all the available scientific data that had been generated uh, during that 15 year period, uh, it included published to toxicity and epidemiology literature. Um, and during that assessment, they found no risks of concern when evaluating all dietary exposure sources, including drinking water for, for these three um, trizine herbicides. The assessment did identify potential risks to children who crawl and play on lawns treated with atrazine or simazine and potential risk to workers who mix, load, and apply atrazine. So again, this is an important, you know, distinction here in, in the, about this process that they, they are looking at, you know, what have we found? Um, we see no risks of concern when, when looking at all these dietary exposures, you know, to the general public, but we did identify a couple of, of, what they said potential risks in these in these two areas that that do need to be addressed, right? And so uh, where we have you know two specific scenarios where we where we have a greater level of exposure, right? I talked about this earlier of you know risk is a a formula of what's the toxicity of a product and what's the exposure to that product, right? So if we have a very toxic product, but we are never exposed to it, there is no risk. But it, it, in the same way, we could have a product that is that has relatively low toxicity, but if we expose ourselves repeatedly in and in, in, in a you know constant exposure, our, our risk could be actually quite high. And so in these two scenarios, you know, EPA identified, okay, well, we have a couple of situations where, you know, even though we've, we've learned that in other scenarios, the risk is very low because of the increased exposure in these two scenarios, um, the risk, there could be potential risk. So in December of 2019, EPA uh, proposed some mitigation that would address those risks of concern for those two specific scenarios. Uh, in, in 2020, uh, again, uh, they released their um, interim registration review position uh, for atrazine. Uh, and so the way that they are addressing this is that they would, in residential turf, uh, 
scenarios, they would reduce the rate. So rates would be cut. Uh, granular residential turf use rates dropped from 2.2 pounds of active ingredient to two. And the spray application to residential turf uh, from a single app drop from two to one pound, right? So their, their way to address that exposure issue is to, to reduce the, the rates that could be applied, thereby reducing the exposure. Now, the occupational handler risk mitigation, um, multiple PPE changes were added to reduce risk to the handlers during loading and mixing process. Uh, this, there was some spray drift management that was proposed, uh, label expansion to include stricter language about managing drift that is more enforceable. And a lot of times that comes down to, you know, label language that, that changes from should to must um, or, or more specific language that allows, you know, a department of ag um, to be able to come in and say, no, this was very clear and specified that you had to do these steps and it was obvious that you did not. And then including a, a non-target advisory statement on labels was part of this um, position um, paper as well. And then we're seeing this on almost all of the new uh, herbicide re-registration reviews uh, that they're adding a herbicide resistant management plan and they're making it more clear than they have in the past. And so this information is being added to the label to provide applicators, uh, producers with more information about things that they can do to manage against the development of herbicide resistant weeds. Uh, and then EPA also added uh, their atrazine stewardship plan, uh, which includes information to be distributed at the point of sale uh, and on the internet. And so if you're going to a, a, a brick and mortar store and buying this product, um, those distributors would be providing you with that stewardship plan information. Okay, and now I'm gonna talk um, briefly then about EPA's uh, 2020 glyphosate interim decision. And so this is based on uh, their re-review that has been going on uh, and, and, and ongoing for a number of years um, and, and in some, did, some ways in response to um, some recent questions that have been raised about glyphosate. So EPA's risk miti mitigation and regulatory rationale, uh, what they have, um, their, their decision, uh, their position that they have released in 2020 was that there are no human health risks identified from exposure to glyphosate the potential ecological risk to mammals and birds was limited to areas in or near the application. Uh, again, this is what, what they've identified is that there are situations where there's a higher level of exposure. And so um, potential risk um, is increased. Again, potential risk to terrestrial and aquatic plants from offsite spray drift. Um, and so this one to some degree is, at least in my mind, is not, a, a, is no surprise, um, right? So glyphosate is a herbicide that's been developed to control weeds um, and is actually labeled for use in aquatic situations to control uh, weeds and, and a lot of plants. Uh, and so it's, it's really no surprise that there could be a potential risk to um, non-target terrestrial and aquatic plants. And so really it's about managing that spray drift. Uh, they identified and, and, and included in their decision um, that, ident that glyphosate is a highly versatile uh, product and provides a broad spectrum of weed control. And so to me as a scientist, it's, it's good to see that in, in these um, decisions. They're also including um, the balanced view of here, here are the risks, but here are also the benefits. And we need to understand how do those things balance out. They recognize that, that glyphosate is generally inexpensive and is a critical tool for weed management in many crops and settings. The EPA con concludes that the benefits outweigh the potential ecological risks when used properly. And when used properly, it, it minimizes and manages 
um, again, that exposure and that potential risk. So what are the proposed label changes to glyphosate that EPA is, is considering? Uh, again, addressing spray drift management, um, including additional language and information on the label about uh, spraying in inversions, um, spraying with the correct wind speed, boom height, droplet size, et cetera. Things that we have continued to see on new labels, uh, re-registrations, uh, a lot of the same stuff that we're seeing uh, with the oxen herbicides. They're including information, again, similar to what we saw with some of the other products, um, enhanced herbicide resistance management information on the label uh, about how to slow the spread and development of, of these resistant weeds. Um, the, the additional piece for the proposed label changes would include uh, enhanced information on the label about herbicide resistance management um, and, and how to slow the development and spread of, of resistant weeds. It would also include uh, a non-target organism advisory statement um, that would be added to the labels. And this one is, is kind of a big one. I think that it surprised me a little bit um, is that they're trying to address label consistency uh, and applying measures to, um, to increase label consistency. There are currently 557 section three registrations. And so when we say section three, that's your typical herbicide label that, that you would see uh, for, for general use. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't typically hear about section three because it's just, that's your typical label. But there are 557 different herbicide labels that contain glyphosate. And then there are an additional 37 section uh, 24C registrations. And so they are proposing to make changes to all of those to improve consistency across all labels. And so that's a, 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 a large task. Um, I feel sorry for the, the person at EPA is having to manage all of that and deal with that. That's a lot of herbicide labels to go through and make changes to. But I, I think it will, it will most likely have a very positive impact um, and, and providing some consistency across all these different glyphosate labels um, and, and making sure that, that language is consistent and use patterns are consistent. Just an example here that, that I'm showing um, of some of the um, language that they're proposing to, you know, uh, include. Um, here I've highlighted uh, some of the mandatory spray drift um, restrictions. Um, again, it's about getting at, you know, some of these application requirements, making it more, um, again, enforceable uh, and making sure that applicators understand, you know, the things that they need to be doing to, to prevent or reduce and manage uh, off-target movement. And again, here's a, a, some additional uh, proposed label changes that, um, that have been included. Uh, here's the, the piece about herbicide resistance management uh, and including uh, this, this label language for these different herbicides uh, and then including some you know, links to specific information about managing herbicide resistance. And with that, that concludes um, the information that I wanted to provide today. I appreciate everybody taking the time to, um, to listen to the presentation uh, and, and gain some more information. Uh, I do have my, my contact info here, uh, my mobile number, my email, and then I am making a plug for the foragefacts.tamu.edu website that uh, uh, Dr. Olson manages. Um, that is that is her website. There's really good information there about um, hay and pasture production. Um, and and um, typically I will get questions about, you know, the cost of some of these herbicides. Um, she has produced a very nice Excel spreadsheet um, that allows you to plug in, you know, your own cost numbers and will help you calculate, you know, the per acre cost um, and make kind of apples to apples comparisons. So just a plug there um, to 
to take a look at that website.